Framework stands out as one of the most innovative and forward-thinking companies in the PC industry. Their latest release, the Framework Laptop 16, takes innovation to a whole new level. It's a fully modular, user serviceable, and repairable 16-inch performance laptop that promises future upgradability. And when we talk about upgradability, we're talking about the holy grail for gaming laptops, a modular swappable GPU. For anyone in the market for a high performance 16 inch laptop with a budget about $1,800, this is a no brainer. But here's the catch. This Framework 16 cost around $2,500. So for many of you, that might not add up. Let's dive into the details and find out if it's worth the investment. It's the money. Hey guys, CJ here with Elevated Systems. I spent the past two months diving deep into two different Framework 16 laptops. In my deep dive series, I've covered the unboxing setup and first impressions of the laptop, insights into its real world performance in DaVinci Resolve and Premiere Pro video editing, an extensive look at its gaming performance, and the RMA process as my batch one unit required a complete replacement. I've also explored the laptop's power demands and battery life. And recently, I put four Linux operating systems to the test on the Framework 16. Now, it's time to condense all that testing and real world use into the ultimate concluding review of the Framework 16. So, as with any review, we're going to break this video into its typical chapters, build quality materials, display quality, keyboard and trackpad analysis, camera microphone and speaker quality, and thermal and noise analysis. However, this review will differ from the norm because instead of bombarding you with a bunch of charts full of benchmark numbers for the performance analysis, I'm going to show you how it actually performs and share my experiences with that performance. Because oftentimes a benchmark chart can be far from the real story. Let's kick things off with an introduction to the Framework 16 and its game-changing modular design. In a world where laptops are often soldered together and glued down, the Framework 16 stands out as a breath of fresh air. You can completely disassemble this beauty into its paste components using just a single tool, which by the way, comes included in the box. This isn't just for show, it's about making this laptop generally user serviceable and repairable. Every part is available for purchase individually from the framework marketplace. So if something wears out or you have a clumsy moment and break something, you can just buy the specific component and fix it yourself. No need to send it off for costly repairs or buy a new laptop. Framework isn't just talking the talk, they're walking the walk when it comes to upgradability. They've released four generations of mainboard upgrades for the Framework 13 laptop, even allowing users to switch from an Intel Power Ultra Portable to an AMD powered beast. This means that in a few years, I can upgrade my laptop with the latest and greatest CPU and GPU combo on the market. But let's be real, with the Framework's current pricing, such an upgrade might cost you as much as a new laptop. But all right, let's dive into the world of modularity and see how it stacks up in terms of durability and that all important fit and finish. Now, you might think that a 16 inch performance laptop held together with some screws and magnets would be a bit of a delicate flower, but the Framework 16 is surprisingly rugged. We're talking about a bottom enclosure made from injection molded and machined magnesium alloy topped off with a machined aluminum panel. This dynamic duo sandwiches all the components into a sleek package that's just 21 millimeters thick. The overall size is 290 by 356 millimeters, which is a tad on the wide side, blame it on the taller 16 by 10 display and the extra room needed for the GPU module. And the whole shebang weighs in at 5.3 pounds or trim it down to 4.6 pounds if you decide to go GPU-less. Now let's talk flex. The screen has a bit more give than your average 16 inch display, but it's not the end of the world, especially since it's not glued or laminated. The keyboard though has some noticeable flex, but fear not, Framework is on the case testing solution and promising to implement said fix into future units and even send out fix kits to any current owners who want one. The input deck is where the magic happens. It's modular so you can mix and match to your heart's content. Want a number pad? 
you got it. How about an RGB macro pad? No problem. And let's not forget the spacers available in various colors to match or contrast with your bezel. You can even opt for an LED matrix or color shift options if you're feeling fancy. But as with any groundbreaking design, there are a few kinks to iron out. There are minor gaps between some modules and the alignment of the trackpad and silver spacers in early units has been less than perfect. My first unit had spacers that were so raised they gave my palm a good scratch. The replacement was better, but still not flawless. And it seems I'm not alone in this, as a quick scroll through the framework subreddit reveals similar tales of woe, spacer were bad enough to damage the display in one case. While the modular input deck is a good idea, it might have been a bit too ambitious. The consensus, which I share, is the modular keyboard is a winner, but the trackpad modular should be a single unit with options to position the pad in the center to the left or to the right. For a deeper dive into this, check out my RMA video. Let's talk about the star of the show, the 16 inch display. It's rocking a resolution of 2560 by 1600 pixels, giving us that sweet 16 by 10 aspect ratio. It boasts a refresh rate of 165 Hertz and a response time of nine milliseconds, making the smooth operator. The tested color gamut is impressive too, covering 99% of the DCI-P3 spectrum. As for brightness, we're talking a range from 20 nits to a dazzling 540 nits. My display did have a slight magenta tint and was a bit oversaturated. The first unit I tested was almost perfect in terms of IPS bloom, but there was some vignetting, especially in the reds. The second unit, on the other hand, had a bit more bloom, but no noticeable vignetting. And yes, one of the reasons I sent the first one back was because the bezel was giving the display a bit of a squeeze causing some unsightly LCD bleed. Thankfully, that wasn't an issue with the replacement, but it does seem like there is some variation in quality in this low volume laptop line. Overall, the display is nice despite the 188 PPI being a tad lower than what I'm used to, everything is sharp and clear. 500 nits is usually more than enough, but I'll admit, in some gaming situations, I find myself pushing it to the max, and sometimes I even catch myself wishing for an extra 100 nits or so. But here's the bottom line. I think this display is a solid choice for an all-purpose laptop. It's got a wide color gamut for the creatives and the native resolution and refresh rates within the capabilities of the 700S, and keeps gaming smooth and enjoyable. That being said, I'd love to see more options in the future to tailor the laptop to your specific needs, like a higher refresh rate and brightness for gamers or a 4K version for the creatives. Maybe even a micro LED panel like we're starting to see in laptops at this price point. In the end, I'd say that next to repairability, the display is the crown jewel of this laptop. All right, let's talk about the input deck. I've opted for the keyboard and numpad combo with the trackpad positioned to the left. I'll start by saying that this keyboard took me longer to adjust to than any other new device I've ever used, but now that I am accustomed to, to it, I don't have any major complaints. However, I also don't have any glowing praise to heap on it. It's an okay keyboard. It has a pretty standard 1.5 millimeter key travel with a somewhat mushy bottom, which is made worse by the deck flex, but I'm hopeful that whatever solution framework comes up with will elevate it closer to the level of the performance of the same keyboard on the framework 13. But Okay, I lied. I do have a complaint, albeit a minor one. I got the basic keyboard and numpad, no RGB, just three level backlight. However, this backlight has to be controlled separately for each module, and there seems to be a bug with my number pad because sometimes the backlight decides not to work while other times it goes into this breathing light mode, which I don't think is an actual official mode. Anyway, popping the pad off and back on usually fixes that. Moving on to the trackpad, it's a smooth glass top hinge trackpad. It's responsive and accurate. I've had no issues with palm rejections or misclicks. My only complaint is that it's undersized for the space available on the input deck. Time to talk about a couple of things on the Framework 16 that 
don't quite hit the high notes. The camera and microphone have been carried over from the Framework 13 light gate kill switches and all. This is what it looks and sounds like. The 1080p webcam is passable, it's adequate for video calls, though color accuracy, brightness, and contrast are pretty meh. Now, the microphone, it's a different beast. It demands the silence of an empty room, just like the one I'm in now, throw in any background noise or a bit of echo, and it struggles. It's not the tool for a lively coffee shop backdrop or busy office. If you're serious about video conferencing, an external mic like a simple USB lavalier is gonna be your best bet. And then we have the speakers. Echoing the 13 inch model, the speakers on the Framework 16 don't pack enough punch. The sound they produce lacks depth. Everything seems to live in the realm of mid-tones without much bass or treble or spatial audio to speak of. They'll do if there's no alternative, but for any kind of immersive audio experience or for clarity during your gameplays, a good headset is pretty much essential. Unfortunately, neither the camera, mic, or speakers take advantage of the Ryzen processor's AI capabilities natively. It's a missed opportunity. Okay, moving on to performance, I'll start by recapping the system specs. I've got the top tier Framework 16 equipped with the Ryzen 9 7940HS and sporting the RX 7700F's graphics module. I've included 32 gigabytes of DDR5600 memory and five terabytes of storage across two M.2 SSDs. It's a dual boot system with both Windows 11 and Ubuntu 22.04 LTS installed by the book using Framework's own guide. This setup cost me a cool $2,760, but if you strip away my extras like the expansion bay shell, the numpad, and the excessive storage, you're looking at a $2,500 investment for a similar Framework 16 pre-built. All right, I'm gonna dip into gaming performance, but I'll keep it snappy since there's a full deep dive on this topic on my channel and check it out for all the nitty gritty. My overall takeaway, the Framework 16 holds its own as a gaming laptop. It keeps the action smooth, maintaining at least 60 FPS in the latest AAA titles at native resolution with high settings. And for competitive titles, it hits 120 FPS or higher. Now, to hit those frame rates on the 7700S, you'll want to make good use of FSR when it's an option or the driver-enabled frame generation when it's not. Cranking up the demands for features like RTX, though, tends to slash the performance by about half in most cases. I don't have a barrage of charts comparing this laptop to a fleet of others. But from what I've seen, the Framework 16 matches up with laptops running a 13700HS and RTX 4060 combo. But here's the thing, those laptops can cost a grand less than the Framework 16. Take the Asus Tough A16 Advantage Edition. It's got the same exact CPU GPU combo, a much faster display, and modular RAM storage and battery, all for a lot less money. In fact, the Asus is still cheaper than the base configuration Framework 16, and that doesn't even come with the dedicated graphics card. Unfortunately, apart from gaming, the 7700S doesn't quite stand up to tasks in most GPU intensive activities. DaVinci Resolve render time benchmarks might position the framework at the top, but real world video editing tells a different story. Timeline scrubbing was slow and jerky with playbacks locking up frequently, making it a chore to locate key points. It was a such a struggle to mark in and out points on clips that I just eventually had to switch back to my Mac Studio to complete my video projects. The situation improves for Premiere Pro users. Premiere Pro leverages both CPU and GPU more effectively, resulting in better performance on the Framework 16, even if the render times don't seem to reflect that. 
3D workflows also take a hit on the lower end AMD GPU. Some might recall this short composition from my Mac Mini deep dive series last year. I managed to create and simulate this entire scene on a base model M2 Pro Mac Mini. On the framework, baking the simulation in Blender took 30 minutes or about three minutes longer than the Mac Mini and rendering the animation took 11 hours and 51 minutes. Considering that task took the Apple Silicon Mac Mini using its integrated GPU 11 hours and 40 minutes, rendering out 542 frames at that speed is far from noteworthy for a laptop with a dedicated GPU. And the viewport performance was even more disappointing. Even at just 50 cycles, the so-called real-time viewport rendering lagged significantly. Any adjustments to my smoke material took too long to show up, making look that virtually unworkable on this machine. Let's be fair, the framework laptop shortcomings here aren't all on its shoulders. AMD's track record with consumer level graphics and drivers has been pretty much gamer centric with little effort for creatives. Because of this, professional software devs, especially those in the 3D realm like Blender, 3DS Max, Maya, Cinema 4D, haven't exactly invested much in AMD graphics. When it comes to the AMD versus Nvidia debate for gaming, I'm staying out of the ring. It's all about what floats your boat feature-wise and performance-wise. However, when we talk professional creative workflows, animation, VFX, editing, compositing, all things I've been doing for over 20 years, AMD graphics has never been the go-to option. And let's be honest, the RX 7700S isn't exactly the Hercules of graphics cards. It's decent for gaming, holding its ground in the $1,500 price bracket, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the RTX 4060 and even the 4070 in some titles. But once we hit the $2,500 mark, that's where it's supposed to punch at the weight of an RTX 4080, coupled with beastly CPUs driving ultra-fast 280 hertz or 4K displays. There, my friend it's in way over its head. I did a deep dive on the power demands and battery life of this laptop, sparked by a discovery about the included 180 watt charger. While it's the first of its kind and a commendable effort by framework, it doesn't pack enough punch to power the laptop at full tilt. But that's a story I've already told. Let's talk about heat and fan noise instead. When it comes to the warmth of the input deck under full load in the performance mode, the mercury hits around 40 Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit right in the keyboard center. Because the heat pipes sit directly beneath this area, unlike most laptops where they're tucked away at the bottom, you feel the warmth right where your hands are across the entire input deck. Even the trackpad gets toasty. Switching to balanced power profile does knock a few degrees off. But let me tell you, this laptop gets uncomfortably warm during intense use. Think gaming, video editing, or 3D work. And don't be fooled, the laptop's belly gets pretty warm too, with the GPU module clocking in at over 40 Celsius. Fan noise is only slightly on the higher side of what you expect from a gaming laptop. Crank it up to performance mode and you're looking at a fan buzz in the low 60 decibel range. Balance mode does quiet things down a bit. But it's not the decibel count that bugs me. I'm like most of you, I expect the performance laptop to sound like it's trying to take off. It's the pitch that gets to me. There's this high pitched whistle that spikes right in the 5200 hertz range. You might not pick it up in this video, but it's reminiscent of the whistle from the Cooler Master Framework motherboard enclosure. For those extended gaming or work sessions, you're definitely going to want a set of noise isolating headphones to drown it out. With that said, however, in light work, productivity, web browsing, media consumption, the fans are dead silent, rarely ever spinning up. When it comes to battery life, don't expect to go the distance on battery power alone during heavy tasks. I put this to the test with Cyberpunk 2077 on balanced mode, and I barely squeezed out an hour of play before the battery nosedived to 20%. 
even a lighter game like Dave the Diver on the integrated graphics drew 50 to 60 watts, leaving me with just about 90 minutes of underwater escapades. Now, there is a trick to eke out more juice. You flip the switch to best efficiency mode, which caps the CPU at a modest 35 watts, and you could double your unplugged playtime. That is, if your game can keep up with that power limit. But let's pivot to more typical off the charger activity. Here's where the framework 16 does well. I ran the Underwriter Laboratories ProSyan battery life test, simulating nonstop real world multitasking hustle using the Microsoft Office suite with this discrete GPU installed but not used, the laptop delivered a solid eight hours and 35 minutes. That's keeping pace with how it runs using the standard expansion bay module. So thankfully the discrete GPU isn't drawing life when it's off duty. And that's a good thing considering swapping between the GPU and expansion bay isn't as plug and play as frameworks marketing might have you believe. We've covered a lot with the Framework 16, and while there's much more I could say, it's time to draw my final thoughts together. I have immense respect for Framework and their mission to champion user serviceable, repairable, and upgradable laptops in the consumer market. The right to repair and modify the products we buy is crucial, and if that resonates with you, then the Framework 16 is worth considering. It's also a standout option for Linux enthusiasts who need a performance laptop with official Linux support. However, for the general consumer looking for the best performing laptop for their money, I just can't recommend the Framework 16. It's a tough sell at over $1,000 more than similarly performing laptops. It just doesn't offer great price to performance, making it hard to justify the steep price tag based on repairability and upgradability alone, both of which come at a significant cost. The RX 7700S graphics module, for example, is priced at $500, which feels steep, especially given the market value of AMD's desktop cards. And looking ahead, any CPU and GPU upgrades could set you back as much as buying a whole new laptop. Repairability doesn't always mean cost-effective or practical. Upgrades aren't included in the initial price. And when Framework makes improvements to or fixes problems with this laptop, you'll need to pay for that new component, like I did to get a more rigid top cover and hinges on my Framework 13. And in many cases, a repair covered under another manufacturer's accidental damage warranty is cheaper and more convenient to get done than buying the part from a framework and doing it yourself on the Framework 16. The Framework 16 is priced as it is, mostly because it's a low volume, basically built to order machine from a small young company. Frameworks unit sold, which maybe totals 10,000 so far for the 16, is a drop in the ocean compared to giants like Apple, but being a niche product with a loyal following isn't always a disadvantage. Just look at the Razer Blade and Dell XPS lines, both of which have continued to command premium prices from their respective audiences. If you're on board with Framework's philosophy, find the modularity and upgrade promise worth the investment, and are okay with the features and performance on offer, then you're likely to enjoy the Framework 16. The upgrade will feel especially significant if you're moving from a much older, less capable laptop. For those who like the Framework idea but can't stretch to the Framework 16's price, then the Framework 13 is an excellent alternative. It's not a 16-inch gaming laptop, but the AMD version is my top pick for an ultra-portable performance laptop with out the repairability tax of the 16. Opting for the Ryzen 5 DIY version and bringing your own memory and storage makes it even more competitive price-wise. And finally, for full transparency, I've decided to return my Framework 16. It just didn't live up to my expectations for a mobile video editing system, which was my main reason for purchase. So despite the potential of the framework, it doesn't fit my professional needs and I just can't justify the expense. And just to set the record straight, no amount of YouTube views can cover the cost of keeping a laptop that doesn't meet my requirements. But hey, if this video hits 850,000 views, maybe I'll buy another one. But hold up, 
this isn't the end of my framework content. I just got the last electronic components in for my next framework mainboard projects. Make sure you're subscribed to catch what this stuff turns into. Thanks for sticking with me through this Framework 16 review. If you found it helpful or entertaining, smash that like button and drop your thoughts in the comments below. Your support means the world and I love chatting with y'all after every upload. 